nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, well, welcome. My name's Terry. So what I wanted to look at is plasma and what plasma is for in our presentation today and what I'm going to discuss today is it's actually plasma is a form of energy. They usually call it the fourth state of matter. And it's an energetic gaseous clod. And what we're doing with that energetic clod is we're trying to get some type of work done. So you apply energy, you get work done. So what's the work that we want to get done? This, this directional etching right here, where I'm looking at making something that if, if I go, do something like this and make this, if I do it like this and make this deep trench like that, this is actually memory. And these that like the preferred geometric shape to make like transistors and sensors and stuff for the most part is like a square or a rectangle. And that's like, you own billions and billions of these rectangles and they're actually etched or chiseled into silicon. So the nature of, I don't know, the internet or your cell phone or the computer that we're looking at right now, or why is there Zoom, is we, we're reliant on these high aspect ratio, which means they're deeper than wide features that are actually etched into the silicon. And if we make them kind of like deeper and narrower, we go from like 32 gigabytes to 64, the 128 to whatever. So when you can make them smaller, you can get more functionality like on your cell phone. So in some senses, the rectangles get deeper, skinnier, and that's how you go from like an iPhone 11 to an iPhone 13. Just roughly, I'm just, you know, saying it as a, an example kind of. So that's the power of making this geometry. If we would do, that's called this directional etch. So what I, what I'm, my point here is, and I was trying to draw on here, I don't, but when we're, when we're doing this, if you would look at this geometry as like an energy vector, we got a lot of energy in this direction. And we have very little energy, like left and right. So it's, it's not very wide. There wasn't much energy gone in this way, but there was a lot of energy that went into the depth. If we look at this energy, and this is called anisotropic, and this is what we get with plasmas. This is the standard plasma etch. If we would just put a, a protective layer right here on top of silicon, photoresist, and then we put it into a directly like an acid, like a liquid, it would etch equally in all directions and we would get this rounded profile. This is called isotropic profile. We don't really use that in modern manufacturing, like in your cell phone. There's not many out of the billions of billions of shapes that are etched in the silicon on your cell phone, like none of them look like this really, but like 99.99% look like this deep rectangle. And the difference is the chemistry here, it actually probably is wider than it is deep. So it's kind of like the opposite you know, the first one is, you know, angular and straight. The other one's a round contour. The one on the left is deeper than wide, and the other one's wider than it's deep. They're, they're really di diametrically opposed, right? And this one, we don't use that much. It would be good, like, for microfluidics and DNA lab on a chip, and I think I'm going to be teaching that later in the seminar series. I'm pretty, yeah, I think I'm doing microfluidics in a few weeks. So we'll look at that then, but it's, it's, it's like a niche market, like a specialty thing. For the most part, the thing that you own the most, because everybody's here on an iPad or a 
a computer or something like that, and you, you have a cell phone, you own billions of billions of the rectangles. Interestingly, with the plasma, we can do this. We can actually make the rounded part like this. And I can do that first by adjusting my recipe. So I made this one in real time. And then I can switch the recipe. And then the bottom part is like this square. So really with plasmas, I could make a round or I could make a square. With plasmas, I could make a V. With plasmas, three-dimensionally, you could chisel any geometric shape that you want. Standard shapes. Why is that impressive? Because this stuff is as big as a virus. So we can make geometry, predictable geometry, different shapes, as big as a virus, billions and billions of times correctly so that your cell phone works. That's like truly amazing. If you would say, I'm going to do this process or I'm going to make features geometrically and I can control that and they're as big as a virus and I can make a rounded one or a squared one or a rectangle or a, a V, if you said that even, you know, 75 years ago to a scientist, they'd be like, you're a little bit crazy. That really can't be done on that scale. We don't have the tools to do that. But today, and within the last, whatever, 30 years maybe, we have this tool of plasma technology, and we can make these features as big as a virus of different geometries, and that couldn't have been envisioned 75 years ago. So that's the title of my presentation is this enabling technology. If we didn't have it, you could simply not have the internet. There would be no such thing as, you know, Apple and Amazon and Microsoft. Those things wouldn't exist because you can't get billions and billions of transistors with isotropic etching, which is wet etching, which is wet chemistry. And there's a few reasons for that. And we're going to examine those reasons. So what I want to, you know, define what is, and that's what I'm doing in the introduction. You know, what is, and wh what are we looking at with nanofabrication? And really scale is part of that. You know, it, on the nano scale, what does that mean? Well, nanotechnology is 10 to the minus nine meters. That's like crazy. You know, that's super duper small you know, millions minus six. This is like a lot more than it's, you know, thousands of millions kind of stuff. You know, it's just like numbers. I can't even get my head around 10 to the minus nine, like nine is a big thing. I can do six. I can, I can envision what a million is. Right. But I can't envision things like billions and billions. It just, it, 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 it I just can't even get my head around that. It's too big of an, I can say the number, but I can't like feel it, you know? So we're going to describe what nano manufacturing is. Then we're going to look at the tools, you know, that are used there. And then I'm going to do, I usually do some kind of summary that changes your life, which is a joke, right? And these are the tools, what they look like. And this tool is, I don't know, in and about big as a pickup truck or something, you know, big as a car. So that's what these tools are and they're cluster tools. And if we look at this, and get, I'll get my pen out here for you. If we look at this, maybe blue will show up nice, so hopefully. When we look at, see this chamber here, that might be an etch chamber. This might be a deposition chamber. This might be another etch or a cleaning chamber. And then this is a loading pod that we put dozens of wafers in. And this is like a schematic on the left. The actual system is on the right. And this thing right here. That's like one of these pods, like one of these chambers. And often they say they're the toilet bowl. They actually are about as big as a commode in a bathroom. So they're in and about, that's for wafers that are 12 inches round or something like that. You know, you can make different machines, but I'm just trying to describe the standard machine that's used for like memory chips and making like LEDs and things like that those machines would be in and about this scale. So they're about big as a car, big as a pickup truck, 
and they have different pods on them. And each individual pod is an etch chamber. I wanted you to get a, an idea of the size of these things. If you wanted to go buy one of these, you, you'd probably have to have $2 million or something. So the, these things aren't hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're millions of dollars. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, a new one and a new one has like support and training certificates with it. And so, and you know, there's a lot of things that come with that, but they're really expensive. So what's nanofabrication? It's the process to control materials on a nanoscale. And on a scale that we want to make dimensions, they're as big as a virus. That's about what we're doing today. And that, that would be about like the, the distance of a gate and a transistor. And these are high value problems and the problems are we're trying to make an etch and we want to make that classic, like really cool, good rectangle. And we start making all kinds of non irregular shapes shown on the top. The solution, the thing that we want to make is mirrored on the bottom drawing. So we want to make that high, the first one over there. And I'm afraid to get my drawer out. I'm sorry. This one right here, this is, this is like memory. That, that's your one or zero. That's your data byte right there. And again, the more data bytes we have and the closer they're compact, the more efficient our phones are. You know, batteries last longer. They're faster, you know, more powerful, et cetera. So that is like, this thing is money. I'll tell you what, this, this geometry right here, that's big time. And then you see these Boeing when you're trying to make the, rectangle and then it starts looking like a carrot or something that's not good and then you see these bending you could have bending in the etch and sometimes that comes from charging inside the wafer so that would be an issue and then when you're making things on that three-dimensional scale looking down from the top you know the, the the proposal here is you're trying to make something perfectly circular and you're making elliptical things and then that would be bad. So these are the solutions. And again, you might not think that that's too impressive, the bottom drawing, but all these things are on a scale of a transistor. So like I said a few minutes ago, if I said, oh, I'm going to be making circular, you know, features that are so many nanometers deep, et cetera, and, you know, millions of them on a chip at a time, people would think that I was crazy 50 years ago. So this is really an enabling technology. And it might seem, if it's not your field, this might seem, you know, very impressive. And even if it's your field, it's very impressive that these are the sizes of the things that we make. So that's really cool. That's why I titled this the enabling technology. So in and about here, on the drawing is a virus. So we're making things on a nanometer scale and we could see we have something like, I don't know, 10 nanometers or something like that. So 12 nanometers, that might be the dimension of, you know, gate transistors, 18 nanometers, something like that. And if we look at that, that is the same area that's typical viruses. So the, these, technologies or the size of these technologies, you know, we have the ability as engineers, scientists, whatever you want to say to examine viruses and look at things like that or whatever, uh, moderately easy, uh, given the technology we have 50 years ago, not so much today. We exist in a world of manufacturing things as big as a virus. So that's really interesting. So when we look at this and say, when we want to make something, why, how could we make it? I mean, physically, it would be hard to do with our fingers because the stuff we're making is too small. And even if we did like a solid, how do you sharpen up something that's, you know, billionth of a nanometer or something, a billionth of a meter? It's like crazy. So how do you do that? And then how would you do it with like a liquid even? Liquids are continuous. And that's kind of strange. So what would, what would be like the, the state of matter 
that might be the right scale, like an atom at a time, molecules at a time, that we can manipulate molecules and atoms at a time? What would be that? And the answer is a gas. So really, when we want to make things so tiny, like our tools or our mass has to be really small, and gas and vacuum systems are really appropriate because they're the right scale to do things atomically. So if you look at solids, liquids, and gases, the gas is the most kind of like discrete atomically. Does everybody see that? So what we're looking at is we're going to apply this plasma, which is an excited gas, because a gas atom molecule is of the appropriate scale to remove a molecule at a time or an atom at a time. So what we like to do is the goal of what etching is, is we want to take solid silicon and remove that. Well, our transport mechanism is to take that solid and through energy convert it into a gas. So silicon, like SI, is a group four material and it's a solid. But if we would chemically uh, tether the outer core electrons, the four bonds that are available on silicon, and if we would terminate that with a, something like fluorine, a group seven material, then what we could do is we could have that volatilize or turn to a gas. So we can make a solid silicon into silicon tetrafluoride and then pump that away. How are we going to do that? So we want to get work done. We want to convert a solid into a gas through this chemical reaction. There's multiple ways we can get that done. We can, but we need energy. So what kind of energy might we use? Well, light might be good, but we don't do that that much. But bombardment, like momentum, is a good way of doing it. And we actually do that. So we would speed up these atoms. Well, it's hard to speed up an atom. If you ionize them, then they're a charged particle. And then in some electrostatic fashion, we can steer that charged particle. That's what we do. We create ions out of the gas. So we, we subtract one of the electrons from the outer core. And now that gas is ionized. Once it's ionized, it's like electrostatically active. We can bend it in a magnetic field or it really wants to be attracted to negative charge. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna set up a negative charge plane and have an ion. When it sees that plane, if you give it enough mean free path, enough clear line of sight, it'll get momentum up and then crash into the surface. And there's gonna be a collision and the release of energy and that's what we're going to use to make a bond. Likewise, we can have other alternate energies. And the alternate energy might be really good is chemistry. So if we could get singular fluorine and put it into this chamber, when it sees silicon, fluorine has seven electrons. It really wants another electron to go to that octet state, right? To go to a group eight configuration. So group seven materials are kind of crazy. They really want that electron. They want to make a bond. So they want to gain an electron. So when it sees, it sees this chemistry available at silicon, it'll make that bond. So fluorine has a high probability because it's group seven to be very reactive. And then we have a material like silicon that could potentially have a bond available. And then the fluorine will attach to the silicon. That's what we want. And if we could terminate all four of the outer core electrons on silicon, then we're going to convert that from a solid to silicon tetrafluoride gas. So we're doing, I'm going to make, I'm going to write this down. We're making my reaction, my goal is to take a solid
and then turn it into a gas. And, and that, is called a volatile product. And that's what etching is. Um, I'm chiseling away, like down here, this, this part of my substrate. I'm getting rid of that, like the green. I'm, I'm removing that. That's, in our example, silicon. And I'm taking this silicon and I'm converting it to a gas. And the gas is going to be pumped away by a, a, some kind of pump, a vacuum pump. So what we're trying to do, our goal is we're taking a solid and converting it to a gas. We have two, we have multiple ways we do it, but the dominant factors are we're going to have some kind of chemistry and that's going to come from like fluorine in our example. And then we could also have and this is like an interaction sign, like an asterisk. I just use that. It's not multiplying. It, it's not adding. It's just like working together, a synergy. It's a team. So chemistry teamed with kinetic energy, which is bombardment. And that's when you take an ion, a charged particle. And then like down here, if you had a box or a voltage plane of electrons, this ion wants an electron. So it's going to go like this, bam, into that surface to try to get one of these. And it does. But in the meantime, it's attracted like this, boom. And when it goes like that, you have kinetic energy. And maybe it'll push fluorine to, into a bond site, something like that, or disrupt that atom. So we're using two forms of energy to make a solid into a gas. And the dominant ones we're going to look at is chemistry and this ion bombardment. And that's what you do in a plasma. You make ions. It's an ion generator. And in fact, when you make a plasma like for a light bulb, like a fluorescent light bulb, you make the ions. And when they come back in and, and, and relax, like the electron comes back into that outer orbital, it releases a photon. So it's like a light machine. So that's kind of cool. So plasma technologies can make products better and sometimes unique products. Plasma for our discussion is an electrically excited gas in a vacuum chamber. Generally, this system is, it's very complex, but it's certainly simple and well controlled. And because it's in a, a well-defined boundary, you can manipulate it moderately easily. Now, how do you know to manipulate it? That might be the question. So I think as a technical challenge is understanding, it's difficult to do. But the physical process is fairly robust. Plasma technology is, is really controlled. When we're making stuff on a nanoscale, we want to have a reaction and then have it repeatable. And we want to do this billions, not millions, but billions of times consistently well. If we would use some other type of technology like chemistry and reuse, say, acid, like dip wafers in acid to etch them, use that analogy, Every time you dip a wafer in to etch it, to make that solid into a liquid and pump it away or dilute it in the solution, every time you do that, the solution changes molarity. Every time you do that while you're doing it, the solution can change temperature. And reaction rate is E to the KT, right? So it has an exponential dependence. So that's a little bit shady and has a chance of being... Uh, variable, and we don't like that. Plasmas are fresh gas comes in, old gas goes out. You reach a steady state. While it's a complex reaction and it's dynamic, it stays uniform. That's, that's what's good. So this plasma technology is used on the assembly line 
And when you're making things billions at a time or bunches of microprocessors on an individual wafer, things get to be cost effective, like per unit. So when you have a bunch of processors on one wafer, when you divide by the number of processors, it gets to be kind of affordable. And that's what we're looking at is the cost effectiveness of this process. And it's very, very cost effective. We can use plasmas to make films, coalesce films and grow films. But this presentation is going to be on etching. We could also do, we can modify films, change them, maybe in somewhat like alloy them or add dopants, something like that. Or we could change the surface of the, the, the morphology or the surface. We could roughen it up atomically, put like ridges in it or something. And that might be good for, you know, take a, take a bio material roughen it up on the atomic scale so that cells would like to adhere to it, like for a dental implant or something. So those things are uses of plasmas too. So we could create films, deposition. We can modify surfaces like a mechanical method. But what we're going to look at today is etching for the removal of material. And again, what, what our goal is, we're trying to take a solid and then melt that away in some fashion. In our case, we're gonna take a solid and turn it into a gas. And again, if we didn't have this technology, you just can't, you literally can't make cell phones, et cetera. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on etching because it's too confusing to talk about deposition, material mo modification, all at the same time because it's just especially in the amount of time i'm allocated today i'm, I'm doing this kind of fast so i don't have time to talk about that so what what are we looking at the plasma itself is an electrically excited gas so the the gas itself has chemical potential but when it's ionized and in the plasma state with the electrical bias, it also has this electrostatic potential that we could have this ion attracted to some region and then come in with momentum. So it would be like, I don't know what's a, a good analogy. Maybe you get on a real tall building and you take something like a really heavy rock and you drop it off the side of the building. Well, that's going to have momentum and build up speed with gravity. And then when it hits into the concrete or whatever below the building, it's going to release energy, like make a hole in the ground or go through a windshield in a car or whatever you want to say is an analogy. But that rock is going to use that energy to do some type of work, like breaking a window or something. So what we're doing with an, an ion is creating it and it's not going to break a car window or go into cement. It's going to hit into the silicon and break that up. So in some senses, it's like an atomic jackhammer. It's like a sandblaster, but we're not using sand. We're not using a chisel with, with like a, you know, mechanically we're using atoms and molecules because we want to work on the atomic molecular scale. So it's an appropriate match of energy. So like I said before, we're looking at the energies to get the work done and the energies to get the work done are going to be the chemistry and the bombardment. And the chemistry is like this in some senses, very, very simply. So this is an introduction presentation and any of these points I'd like to give like three pages of math and talk about just one point for an hour or whatever. Right. But we're, we're doing something like, so one of the most common etch ga gases is carbon tetrafluoride. 
So it's carbon and carbon's a gas because it has four fluorines on its uh, terminal electrons. So uh, carbon tetrafluoride is probably the most popular etch gas going. And what we do in the plasma, we go like this and we break the carbon from the fluorine. So now what we have is, and I can't, I'm drawing pretty good for not seeing where I'm drawing. I'm impressing myself. We have like four Fs. And now those fluorine can participate with the silicon to make SIF4. So what we're doing is we're substituting with this fluorine gas, we're substituting the, the carbon and replacing it with fluorine. Often what we do with the carbon is we would trick that, we'll add some oxygen and it'll tie up the carbon, this carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. So we have the carbon tetrafluoride that's a stable molecule. The plasma cracks it apart. The fluorine wants to make a bond. Might want to go back together with the carbon, and sometimes it does. But we might do something like take the carbon and give it something like oxygen, and then it's stable. Then the fluorine's like, what do I do? What do I do? It'll attack the silicon. Does everybody see that? So that's what we're doing. So etched technology, we're, we're getting this electrically excited gas. And what we're doing is we're chiseling out the features and we have two energies, chemistry energy and bombardment energy. The chemistry energy comes from like fluorine in our example, and the bombardment energy is gonna come from ionized particles. So what we're doing is we're, there's two basic geometric shapes for etching. There's the isotropic one. So when you're in the tropics, you're like relaxed. So that's like a bowed circle. And the anisotropic one, it's like a rectangle or a square. And it's generally deeper than it is wide. So we know we had more energy going down than energy going out. Just how, how it is. So anisotropic, our goal would be to have relatively straight sidewalls. Does everybody see that? And this is isotropic versus the anisotropic. Isotropic would undercut the resist and give us rounded stuff. What we would like is anisotropic, which is that rectangle. Is everybody good on that? So these are the different etch profiles. With wet etching, we only get rounded profiles, isotropic. And for current technology, that's not useful. What we want to have is the anisotropic dry profile. What's worse is in this scenario right here, in wet etching, say we dunk this in, if we put a liquid in here across this resist, the liquid might do this, not even go in the resist because of surface tension. So around, it depends on the fluid and the material and all that other stuff, around two to three microns, depending on what the liquid is, et cetera, you potentially could have a lot of surface tension. So I know you've been outside like near a lake or a pond or something, and you could see like bugs, like spiders walking across water because their feet, and the hairs on their feet are really small and they don't break the water tension. A hair is about a hundred microns. We can see with our eyes, probably 30 microns. So it's 10 times smaller than you could resolve with your vision. That's how big these holes would be in a wafer. So we can't even see these things are so small. If we put it in a liquid, the liquid can't go in. Real small features. So why is gas plasma's enabling feature technology? Because they can go into real small cracks to make submicron devices. Transistors, memory is all submicron. Liquids don't go into submicron features because of surface tension. 
So why can't we use wet etching when things are small? Wet won't go into the little holes. Maybe what's worse is if the water or the acid goes in and it's down here, you can't get it back out and like clean it or rinse it out or stop it. Then your feature gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it's uncontrolled. So wet etching is not good because it doesn't fit the scale. Due to surface tension, it cannot be it cannot be used on smaller patterning devices. It cannot be used on real small devices because they're so small the liquid won't go into those features like our template, our lithography. So that's really something. So wet etching, for the most part, that technology is not for modern technology. We have to define modern devices and sensors have to be defined by gas because gas can get into small crevices and not only that, with vacuum, we can get the gas back out. So again, probably like take home messages, things that you might have not thought of, certainly if this is not your field and this is your initial presentation and that's what I was told I'll, to make this as a foundational presentation explain all the details so why do we like to use gas plasmas because we can get gas in and out of small features features are the dimensions on like a, a semiconductor chip and liquid can't do it it's physically because of surface tension limits its ability to be in small patterns in the small areas so in the gas phase we can get stuff done in the liquid phrase, we can't get it done below a couple microns or so, below 10 times smaller than you could possibly see with your eyeballs. So we use plasma, and it has these directional sidewalls. And again, those sidewalls and those rectangles, that's memory. So that's interesting to us. So wet etch is isotropic. So generically, what we're going to do is we're going to take a wafer define it with a pattern like a stencil lithography, and then we dip it into a solution like an acid. Well, it's, it's, it's easy to understand. Really, you don't need a multi-million dollar tool. You need a bucket with acid in it, right? And then we dip our patterned silicon wafer in there with photoresist or something. And we can do maybe even a bunch of wafers at once, put in a dozen at a time, take them back out again. So we can do that in somewhat parallel if we have a big enough container full of our etchant liquid, right? But the big drawback here is we only get that rounded profile. And nobody wants the rounded profile. It's really doesn't, it's not an active geometry that you would have in digital world. So it has limited applications. Good for stuff like microfluidics, but that's rare compared to billions and billions and billions of transistors that people buy, a single person buys every year usually, right? In wet etching, because we have a whole vat of acid, like a gallon of acid or gallons, it, there's a large, a large amount of waste material. And then it's really hard to control because chemistry is E to the KT, temperature changes, concentration, like molarity changes. It, it, it's really just not very good and we, we want to have like repeatability on the atomic scale. So that's not the best. So in and around two or three microns, you can't get a liquid into a small feature and back out again. So then it's really not for the world of manufacturing sub micron world of today. So it's, it's not that good. So it's not that interesting, but what I wanted to say is, or what's the message in my presentation? Plasma is an enabling tool because wet is not a good tool. It's not efficient enough for us for the sizes of things that we want to make. So we have to understand plasmas 
because they're, they're the tool that we need. So here's a bonus pull to wake you up like a pop-up window in the internet. So in 1962, what was the name? And you can put it in your chat or open up your microphones. I'll give you a minute to think about it. Who joins the Beatles in 1962? The name of the person that joins the Beatles in 1962. If I got somebody on this trivia guy. Yes, Greg got it right. Ringo. And I think the Beatles, they're before my time, but the Beatles really, I think they were really deserved their notoriety. You know, they were pretty cool. I, I'd like to hang out with Ringo. I think he'd be probably the, you know, to go out, have a meal or something. I think Ringo would be pretty entertaining. Seems like a really nice guy. Before him, the drummer was Peter Best. And then he got replaced by Ringo. You know, and, and Peter Best had a lot to do with the formation of the Beatles. But then he left. I watched a special about it a while ago on YouTube. So his mother had the infrastructure, like a studio or something. And so then the Beatles formed, but they formed because she had that Peter Best mo mother had this thing. But then he left. And then Ringo took his place. But see this drawing here, and this is like more baby boomer stuff, right? Uh, and I'm the last of the baby boomers myself. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm the youngest of the baby boomers. You know, there's baby boomers that are older than me. But uh, I'm at the, right at the end of that generation. This is the, the toy that you potentially could have had if you had enough money back in the 70s or whatever. And uh, this is an Etch-A-Sketch. And on the Etch-A-Sketch, there's like a cursor thing in there. And you can move around this mechanical knob and pick up these particles kind of on the screen. And what it's going to do is you can move the left one. And I don't know if that's true. The left one is going to go, for our example here, we're going to say the left cursor, like this one right here, that's going to make the cursor on the screen go like this, left and right. This cursor over here, when you move the knob, it makes it go up and down. So if you can go up and down and left and right, then you could, you know, start drawing hair on Paul, right? You could start doing that. And here's Ringo down here. You can give him some nice bangs in his hair so that he can have the go like this and stuff when they do their little solos and whatnot. So this is what we're basically doing, you know, in some analogy. So if I have control of chemistry, like a left and right control knob dimensionally, and then if I can control bombardment, which is my uppy down knob through ions, the chemical reactions are my left and right. So left and right is chemical and up and down is bombardment. If I have that available to me, just like you have that available to you on an Etch-A-Sketch, what can you draw? Kind of anything. So in some ways, this is, a, this is like an analogy and it's to get your interest, right? So presentation should be interesting and relatable so you can relate to this you can use these energies like knobs and you literally do in some senses and they're atomic knobs so that we could do this we could draw v's and u's and rectangles and squares we could draw whatever we want as big as a virus. And that's my presentation. So how do I do that? I need control factors. I need spatially 
I need one to go left and right and one to go up and down. So kind of, we can say these things are independent. They're a little bit more dependent, but we're going to say we're going to isolate them. And they're, they're fairly well isolated, so it's not a, it's not a big stretch of the imagination. But I like to be accurate, so I said kind of, because someone could potentially uh, argue that these knobs are coupled together, and they are. So here they're pretty independent. But you know what you could do to make a rounded thing like this, drawing the beetles like their face or whatever, you do them both at the same time, right? So that's what we can do in some senses with plasma. So etching, you know, here, making these geometries, like over here in this area, it, it has a lot to do, like, it's a lot like an Etch-a-Sketch, at least in my mind. And then I always say to be funny, and people might do it, so then I might be like being cruel. I hope not, but you, you wonder who made that. They must be lonely or something to sit there and do that. But then that's not necessarily true. So I like to do stuff like, you know, concentration things and just focus on things, you know. So you do that. I think drawing like that is the same as going bowling or shooting or something, you know, playing darts playing pool. It's a concentration game. So to do that's like knitting or crocheting or something, crossword puzzle solving. So it's kind of a neat thing. So it's not that bad. But that's impressive because I can't draw. So people draw all kinds of stuff on Etch-a-Sketches because of the retro, you know, novelty of it. I think it's pretty interesting that people can do that. But really what we're doing is those multi-million dollar etch tools that I showed in the beginning of the presentation. Let me go back up again if I can. My dog's kicking me here. She's sleeping now. Look. Can you see her? So she's going to be going, as soon as my daughter knocks on the door, it'll be like a tornado. She'll be barking and crazy. She's sleeping next to me now. This is my playroom downstairs in the house. On my so she's allowed on this couch. And she's my be good friend. So she's allowed there. But she, keep she keeps on kicking me. So I'm like this. If you see what I'm doing, I'm not. So you know what it, it is. So this is these are the multi-million dollar etch tools. And they're big as a car. But in some ways and it's just an analogy, right? They're like an Etch-a-Sketch. And what we're drawing is memory chips or microprocessors or fire alarms, you know, smoke detectors, airbag sensors. We're, we're doing stuff like that. Does that make sense? So we're, we're atomically doing like an Etch-a-Sketch, but we're not drawing. We're actually taking a solid and turning it into a gas and we're leaving dimensions to, to, to look like that, like that wine glass that I showed you before. So this is the, the tool itself. And again, these are the cluster tools right here shown in the left picture. Each one of those pods potentially could be like an etch system. And when you open up the etch system, like the lid on there, you can see that's the, that's the microprocessors on a silicon wafer. So they're processed in something that looks like, I don't know, a French fryer or a toilet bowl, something like that, like a sink in your house. That's what a plasma tool looks like when you open up the lid. You generally, they're, they're enclosed and they're under vacuum. They're doing that and you can see the wafer. This is for display so somebody could take a picture. You really never open up a plasma chamber because it gets contaminated with the gas that's in the room. So that's all done under vacuum conditions. But that just to shows you where the wafer sits in there and how they work. And then again, on the left, there's multiple etch chambers on this tool called a cluster tool. Inside the middle, that round sphere, 
you might see like an arm like this. And basically what it does is it feeds wafers back and forth to the individual pods. So that system is like a mini production line. It might do multiple steps, like three of the steps in your process to make a microprocessor. So that's called a cluster tool. And again, they cost millions of dollars. So what is a plasma? It's the fourth state of matter. A good thing that you know about is uh, simply that you can understand as a fluorescent light bulb. So fluorescent light bulbs are under vacuum to give a mean free path, which is the distance between gas atoms or molecules, statistically how the distance that they're separated in any instant. So we, we wanna have a moderately long mean free path because we wanna attract an ion to the surface. And if it bumps into another atom or ion or something, it keeps on bumping into things, it can't get up momentum. You need a clear path to get momentum. So I always use the analogy, like you have a sports car and you put it against a wall and you hit the gas pedal. Well, not good things are going to happen, but the car is not going to self-destruct. You'll probably scratch it up or something and the tires might smoke or who knows what, but it's not going to be like a big event. But if you took that same car and that same wall and you backed up the car like 50 yards or 20 yards, and then you hit the gas pedal and gave it a distance and it still has the same like energy, it could use that horsepower and get that momentum. And then it, when it hits the brick wall, you're going to have a big collision and you're going to have a number of release of energy events. Does that make sense? So the mean free path is a distance and you want to give it that distance so that it can get up a speed. So when it hits into it, it makes or breaks a bond. Because that making breaking bonds is the conversion from a solid to a gas. So again, we want to take a solid and convert it to a gas. We want to get work done, so we need energy. Some of the popular energies that we could have here is chemistry and bombardment, and that's the root of my presentation. So what do you know about a basic plasma? Well, a fluorescent light bulb is a basic plasma. It's under vacuum for that reason, for a mean free path, because we want to have ions and we need some kind of distance so they can be smacking against each other. What do you know about a light bulb? It uses electrical bias to be a light bulb. If not, it's not lit up, right? So you need to have potential energy. You need to have that energy like a voltage across there. And then, you know, the gas itself, if we put different gases in a bulb, like argon or oxygen or nitrogen, when they ignite because of the orbitals and the quantum effect and how they transition and release a photon, that step of energy, that quantum step of energy, they're different colors when they glow. So oxygen is a different color than like nitrogen. So oxygen is like a blue white and then nitrogen is like a pink, I guess, pink, pink purple. So in a plasma system, it's neat because we put fresh gas in like our etcha gas, our group seven, like CF4, and then we pump away the old gas. So it's always like clean it's not like you have a sink and you're using the same dirty water. It's like you have the faucet open, new water comes out, wash your hands, and then new water's coming out. It's always clean water, you know? It's not like you're in a basin and reusing the stuff. So that's what's nice. The, the quantum effect is when the g gas gets excited, it releases a certain color. So that's the orbital, the outer core orbitals on the gas. This is a man-made environment, so we can have unique chemical reactions. So typically what we do in a plasma system, we have vacuum on there. We pump them down to maybe 10 to the minus six tor. There's really not much of anything left in the, the, the chamber. The, the amount of atoms and molecules in there 
is pretty, pretty low. So then what we do is we can consider that clean. Then we generally, in a plasma system, like an etch system or deposition, we would use pure, pure gas bottles. And then from that vacuum state, apply gas so that we get more pressure in there. And then we have that reaction. But it's a controlled reaction because we had a real clean chamber and then real pure gases. So we know what's going to happen. So we, it's a man-made reaction in a man-made environment, and it's very controlled. And then naturally, we're going to create ions in there with the bias. So the plasma itself contains the two energy forms that we're interested in. We split apart molecules to get like free fluorine, which is group seven, or free chlorine. We can have a chlorine gas. And it's usually stabilized, like a carbon chlorine. We can get rid of the carbon there, and then the chlorine is free to do stuff, like silicon. And you can have uh, silicon. Uh, you can have silicon with four chlorines on it too. So that's another way of etching silicon. Generally, generally, for silicon, you probably would use chlorine and bromine, and for silicon dioxide, then you would probably use CF four. So there's, there's selectivity issues there, goals. So there's different gases that you would use, and they would be chemically aggressive, which is selectivity. So they can select one material versus the other. So, so typically, chlorine doesn't etch dielectrics well, like silicon dioxide, but chlorine is really good on singular silicon. So that would be a selective etch. So if we wanted to form, if I wanted to do just a silicon layer, but not an adjacent silicon dioxide layer in my manufacturing of a thin film device, like memory chip or something, I would use chlorine because it doesn't attack silicon dioxide, but it would do the silicon. Uh, fluorine does both. So then that's not a good option. So it, it doesn't really differentiate. The selectivity number for that is not very good. And then bombardment, the ions come in and hit into the surface. That mechanical bombardment is really blind. It doesn't care what material that you, it bumps into it's going to etch that or have a reaction when it has a threshold of energy. That threshold of energy might be something like 50 electron volts. Then, then almost any material can be etched with that. The plasma also contains, so it's chemistry and it has ions, but the majority of it is just the gas that you put in like CF4. It also, in the plasma, we have zipping around in there free electrons because we got an ion that the atom lost an electron. And so it lost one. Well, the electron's in there. And those electrons themselves, they're bouncing into other atoms and they're creating ions. Does that make sense? We're, we're doing the reaction with the chemistry, but that's selective. And then we have the bombardment, which does everything uniform. But when we mix them together, you know, we can still get selectivity from the chemistry, but the bombardment is uniform and it's non-selective. The electrons that are floating around in that plasma, they're actually bumping into other electrons on orbitals. And, and they're, the, they're the, really the event electron collisions that are generating the ions. So electrons beget other electrons in some senses or beget the disassociation from the atom or molecule that they're ionizing. So really the electrons are the thing that sustains the plasma. So this is when we have an electron, a free electron in a field, like an, an electrostatic field, that's the bias. 
when it, it when it grabs hold of that electron and it can give it momentum, that momentum of the electron bumps into another electron, and it's really good because they're the same mass. So you get a really good momentum transfer. So that way that can knock off the other electron. So the, the free electron that was the initial, excuse me, generated electron, what it can do is bump into another atom and then it's gonna knock an electron free creating an ion. When that free electron is in there, again, it can create other ions, but it could also re, uh, go back in and go into that site that needed an electron. So it can go back and stabilize that ion back into an atom then. And what happens at that point, it releases a photon. That photon is kind of like acoustically, but it's a different thing. It's like hitting a different size bell. You would hear a different noise, a different sound. So the atoms themselves are different sizes when that electron comes back in and, and f fills that energy void, it's just like a different size bell. It would have a different emission. In, in the bell case, we have an acoustic emission. In the atom case or ion case, we have a light emission. So the light is kind of in some senses a function of the size or the resonance of that particle, that outer orbital. So that's where we get the uh, light from. So in this case here, we would have the fluorine and what we do is we can get, use the fluorine as an ion. So then that's like really cool because we have the chemical from the fluorine and or the bombardment from the fluorine. So why is this important? So we use the bombardment to apply the kinetic energy and then we use cracking the molecules to get the, the, the chemical energy and the bombardment energy. And then what could you do when you're able to independently control these, the magnitudes? So my point here is, let me say this explicitly. I can program the machine so that I have a tremendously huge chemical vector. The amount of energy is really big. And then I can also just have a little bit of bombardment. So that means I'm using this knob left and right real a lot. And then this knob, not so much energy. So it's like I'm, I'm you know, the left and right one I'm turning a couple times and a bombardment one over here. So this is the bombardment one up and down. And this is the left and right. I'm moving the left and right one a lot. And the up and down one, not so much. And then when I do that on my screen, I'm going to make something like this or whatever. You know, a line like that. I can likewise do like a little one like this. And then a real big one. Big bombardment. Like use this knob a lot. And this one, not so much. And then I'm going to draw something that looks like that. So you're, you're making different geometries by controlling the chemistry in a bombardment vector. And then what could you make with that? Well, you can make drawings like this. So these are, I don't know when, I think they made this this is Salvador Dali, I think. I think this is, uh, he did these things in the 1950s or something. I'm pretty sure that's Salvador Dali. These are famous drawings, and that's his, uh, his painting on the right. And then somebody redid it on the Etch-A-Sketch. It is what it is, but I'll tell you what, you really have to have like, a lot of patience to do that and everything like that. And you have to be gifted artistically. I can't do that. That's pretty impressive, you know? So let's draw a system and see what it looks like and how do we get that? So I'm like 
telling you about the machines and the tools and, you know, what we're doing, but I, I want to show you how we do it. So what we were doing is, is the question I think I've been discussing and then how to do it. I want to go to it now. So what we do is, and I'll just run my pen around here a bit. We create, we put my gas in here's my gas is CF4 and oxygen. Like I was talking about before there might, this is my vent gas. So we're not worried about the nitrogen right now, but the, the CF4 and the oxygen, they're my etch gases. And really what I want to get out of this is the fluorine because my wafer that sits on the cathode is silicon. And I want to do the, it's a solid, but if I make it into this, it turns into a gas and, and it can, so that this solid goes like this in this pump and it gets pumped away. So my goal is to take a solid and turn it into a gas. I'm doing that by doing this chemical reaction with fluorine, but I do form with carbon, et cetera, in here like ions. So there's a bunch of ions in here. So everybody has that. So let me get the eraser thing out here. Erase this so it's not as busy. So I have a bunch of ions. But for every ion, I lost like an electron in that collision. So the ions are charged particles like charged atoms that they lost an electron. So there's a lot of free electrons, but electrons are small and fast and ions are big and slow. So these electrons potentially, so this electron's a charged particle, right? So electron, if it goes to the sidewall, like right here, the sidewall's grounded. So the electron basically goes to ground. because the chamber is grounded. And so we lose that electron. The ions want electrons. So the ions want electrons. But if we look at, you know, maybe the key on this drawing, if we look at one of the keys on here, from engineering, we understand that a capacitor can pass alternate current because it's lines of flux. So then where's my cursor. So up here I can put AC and RF power from my RF power source. So that power will go through the capacitor. So what I'm going to do is go back to this anodate bar and, 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 and hope that it works. My drawing. When I make those electrons, if they go to ground, they're dead. But this capacitor right here prevents them from going to ground. So I can actually build up electrons on my wafer. So the ions see those electrons and they come down with a mean free path and have a collision. So the electrons that are built up through the capacitor are an attractive voltage plane. The ions see that and they come down with kinetic energy. That's my bombardment. And then naturally, when I break apart my CF4, then that's my chemical energy. So the magic to my drawing here is I create a plasma. A plasma has ions and electrons. The electrons can build up on the wafer via the capacitor. The ions see that and come in with momentum. If I change the throttle valve, I change the mean free path, which changes the amount of electrons, the voltage plane, and it controls the distance of the mean free path. When I change the pressure from like 10 millitor, I get straight up and down etching. And if I change the vacuum level to 200 millitor, I get rounded. So really, by just changing the vacuum level, I change chemistry and bombardment, the relative size of them. The maximum bombardment is like 10 millitor. 
And if I wanted to have like a thousand Militor, then what's going to be maximized there is chemistry. And my bombardment's going to get small. So my goal was to use my Etch-a-Sketch knobs independently. How is that taking place? It's actually through those knobs and the knobs or that control left and right energy is controlled by the throttle valve or the vacuum level. So the thing that makes a rounded profile or a squared profile is the amount of vacuum that you have. If you have tens of Militor, you get memory. And if you have hundreds of Militor or a thousand Militor, you get like a rounded trough for like DNA lab on a chip. But you can just select that control variable in your etch system and you can make things like a wine glass. So this is called the wine glass profile. So here's the end in summary. Nanofabrication is valuable because then you wouldn't have the internet or Amazon stock or Apple stock or whatever. It's an enabling tool. So if you didn't have this tool, you couldn't have dry etching. And then plasmas, you know, they're not all of the semiconductor market, but they're super duper critical machine in the manufacturing process of modern semiconductors, sensors, et cetera. So they're dreadfully important. And then maybe the thing out of here is you look at these ideas of chemistry and bombardment and electrostatics and opposites attract, likes repel, how you can, you know, what, what a group seven material does, you know, what does carbon like to react with, like oxygen. There was a bunch of little engineering concepts but when you put these integrate, you put these concepts together, these principles, then you understand this complex system of dry etching. And, and I think that is, it's not life changing or nothing, but that's my summary. You know, what we did in here, we looked at, I think, moderate, uh, you know, tenants and signs, and we put them together and how they operate. And we came up with a plasma system. So with that, I think I'm done. These are uh, folks up in uh, Erie are our partners uh, at Erie Community College, actually up in Buffalo. Uh, and we've been working with these fine folks for quite a number of years. So uh, very, very knowledgeable crew. Uh, and Rich and your 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 uh, your assistant there is name. I forget. I used to mention it earlier. Brandon. Brandon, Brand, Rich and Brandon are going to going to do a little demo for you now. Thanks, yeah, Rich. Brandon, we'll take it away. Sure. Uh, Brandon's going to run run the camera, move the cart for me today. Uh, he's making us a presence there. Um, so um, there's a little demonstration of doing uh, reactive ion etching. This is our etcher right here. Um, but a little prep that I made for this demonstration was I took a piece of a wafer. I put some tape on it. And I, um, I'll move it around a little bit so maybe you can catch the line in the middle. And so I put some tape on it. I put down aluminum on my piece of wafer with our thermal evaporator right here. And then I'm going to, I taped, what I did is I taped a little piece of wafer to it so that I could protect some of the wafer when I etch it. So I'm hoping that when I'm done here, that we're going to end up with um, like a little step, a couple of three steps. I'm going to do that over. I'm going to show you on the profilometer. So let's get started. I'm going to push our vacuum button here. I've already got it under vacuum, so I got this prepped ahead of time. So we're going to etch in our etcher here with CF, uh, CHF3 and oxygen. So just like Terry was describing to you, we're going to bombard our wafer inside there. And our plan is to etch away silicon so that we can measure on a profilometer and I can show you the different levels that I made and what they are. So I've reached about 150 millitor. I'm going to turn our process on. It's going to run for a minute and 30 seconds. So this demonstration is going to be pretty quick. Uh, the pre-prep has helped us do that, so that's nice.
you can see, uh, if you can see this, uh, he's going to try to show you this. I have it set three and two is kind of the ratio we're using with our oxygen and our CHF3. So it's three CHF3 SCCMs to two oxygen SCCMs. Sometimes you got to watch it make some small adjustments. Um, but timer's got about a minute to go. Uh, the profilometer, it's going to measure, um, tell us the roughness of the surface. So it's going to show us each one of the steps that we have made there. I'm running this at about 200 watts for my RF set point. Uh, our machine will range from basically you know, zero to 300 watts. Uh, our experimenting we have done here has given us this opportunity um, to figure out things, which one works best for us. Um, I did some experimenting over the last couple of days, and I found that uh, this minute 30 is good for us for this demonstration. So I hope that it um, looks good when we're done with it, since they all can be different. Okay, our process has ended. I'm going to give it a few minutes here to recombine. So like Terry was describing, we got all kinds of things bouncing around in there. But we have free radicals in there that are looking to recombine with something. So we're going to give it an opportunity to do that so that we're not opening the door and having them rush out trying to recombine. I'm going to turn my vacuum off. I'm going to turn my gases off. I had them preset to help make this go faster. So that was a, a help to us. All right, gases are off. I'm gonna slowly start to introduce uh, atmosphere back to our chamber. Just to give it, a, give it time, like I said, to do its work inside for the gases and all those um, electrons and things bouncing around. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, this machine here, I, I believe this ran us about $30,000, 30, 35. Well, we could give you a brief introduction to our thermal evaporator while we're waiting another couple minutes. Uh, that's the inside of our thermal evaporator. You're looking at the boat there where we place our aluminum. So what I, what I deposited on the silicon wafer was aluminum. Basically, we evaporated it so that it rose from that boat to the top of our chamber and deposited to the silicon wafer, which was located at the top of the chamber. We're almost ready here. A little, a little more. Open it up a little bit more. Okay, we're getting close. And if you can hear it over the microphone, I apologize. <laughs> this one is pretty noisy. <laughs> it will calm down when I open up the door. All right, we will take it out now. So here's my description of what I was talking about when I had uh, put that wafer on to protect it. I taped it on there. So now we're going to remove it and we're going to take it over to the profilometer and we're going to measure and show you what the steps look like on a nano scale. I started out with like about 65 nanometers of metal. All right, so now I'm going to bring our probe down to see the surface, to touch the surface. Then we will line it up so we can uh, measure it.
All right, let's go. So now I'm looking for the edge. It's right there. There it is. All right, I'll go up a little bit higher here just to show you what I was talking about. So here's the outline of the part of the wafer I protected with that little piece of wafer I taped to it. And I protected an area of the metal also. And then all around the outside of that clean, smooth looking area is where I etched away some silicon. So what we're going to do now is we're going to measure that. I just got to get it set up for us. Let's see. Yeah, I think a thousand will do it. All right, so I got it set for a thousand micrometers and it's going to do it for 30 seconds. Let's see what kind of image we get. So it's running across the surface, and now it's in the protected area. As soon as it crosses this line that's passing down now, then it will show us the area we etched away. So we should have another step. Looks like we just got away with it with a 1,000. Barely, but we can get the idea. So right about in here, and this whole area where I'm swiping the red through is the area that I protected. And I have about 73 nanometers of um, metal. But if I move my cursors, if I move this, let's close this one up a little bit. We got some abnormalities we ran into. So right there, like this, the total height is 149 nanometers, but I'm on the metal. So if I move to the silicon area, I can see that I have approximately removed 73.3 nanometers of new meters of material by bombarding it, like Terry was explaining to you guys. That is basically my demonstration. Richard, you're talking about the cost of the etcher. Did that include the pumps? Is that just the chamber yes. or did that include the pumps? That, that was the, that was, we just have one pump. It's a rough pump. So we just do rough pump etching. And yes, it did come with a pump. And I believe it was somewhere around that $30,000, $35,000 mark. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Our friend from Mexico. Oh, what kind of gas did I add? I did not. I just added atmosphere. Um, as Terry mentioned, uh, a lot of systems uh, like universities and things will use nitrogen as a purge gas. So what I would have done when I opened up that gas valve, that valve to vent the system, I could connect nitrogen to it and I could have introduced that, but I'm introducing just regular atmosphere in our facility. It, it for us that it, it is, is all we need for us. It's not a sin to to to, to end a little early, is it, Rich? I'm not sure. Pretty oh sure no, of course not. Okay, okay. I've got quite a bit to do today. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for hanging in there, and thank you for um, for uh, for for assisting today. I really appreciate it. So. Yep. No problem. You are very welcome.